Prince of Gates. Mourning in death shall be no more. Come, let us worship the God of our salvation.
So in the Gospel of Mark, there was a man who asked Jesus, which of all the commandments, there are hundreds that Jews have that you know about, if we have ten, and we're lucky we can follow most of them, right? He said to Jesus, which is the most important? What do you think he said? Do you remember? Do you remember? What would you think would be the most important? Okay, well, I'm going to give you a hint. Let's ask that out there. Oh, it has to do with the heart, yeah. So does anybody know what the greatest commandment is? Rana, a member here, was a wonderful saint that had such a cheerful heart. Every time that I saw Rana, she was smiling. And she loved the Lord. She loved the Gathers. She loved to study the Bible. She loved to be in Sunday school with her husband, Bob. She loved this church and the people here. So today we celebrate Rana Gardner. Tom Kiefer. Tom was a man that used his hands and his gifts and his talents. One of the things that he last accomplished here were pouring the concrete steps out from the hospitality room and putting up a handrail. I remember that Tom used his gifts to glorify God. He was a man who loved to be adventurous. He drove a long way to come to church and worship here. And he drove a long way to come to Angel Spirits. He had a dog named Pearl that he would bring frequently to church. And Tom loved life. Surely, Tilford. 
Shirley, otherwise known as Mama Bear, had a heart and a passion for ministry and loving others. At Christmas time, Shirley would gather gifts, and she would have a meal, and she would have food to give families for their Christmas meal. She would have Christmas presents that the parents could go in and pick out, and then the staff here would, and the people in the church would come and wrap those gifts, and they would take all the food and the gifts home, and they would have Christmas for families that didn't have quite enough. So today, we remember Rana, Tom, and Shirley. May God bless their souls. Our scripture verse this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. It's not, I had the wrong one in the bulletin. And it is the 13th chapter, or the 12th chapter, beginning with verse 28. Here now, God's word. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked, which commandment? is the first of all. Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than the, all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Then Jesus saw that he answered wisely. He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, here we are. We've come to worship. We've come to praise you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Renew us. Encourage us in meaningful ways as we learn faith and beauty and love. Amen. In our scripture text today, we hear some pretty familiar words, don't we? Heart, soul, mind, strength, neighbor. And we've learned and we agree that loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, and I'm not talking about what's inside of your body, I'm talking about what's inside of us that makes us passionate, is a transformative journey. I'm talking about the very things that make you unique in you. I'm talking about the things that you have a passion for. Not too long ago, I attended a Christian concert, and I could tell that certain songs and certain parts of the lyrics that this performer sang stirred a passion within the people. They were deeply moved. And you know how I knew that? Because as I looked around, people were not sitting. How many times have you gone to a concert where people sit? They stand, right? Because they're passionate. Well, this just happened to be a Christian concert, and so people had their hands in the air, and they were reaching up. And I recently read that as a child, they reach up for what reason? To be held by someone who loves them. 
Could his name be said of us? Lord, I worship you and I praise you. And you know what else I noticed? Who goes to a concert and doesn't sing any of the songs? And not me. I sing every word to every song that I know. And there are some songs that I like even better than other songs. What about you? Yeah. And we sing, we belt those words out, don't we? With passion. Because they have meaning in our life. I looked around a little more, and I don't know what happened, but, you know, like, they have this foggy stuff that they... It fills the whole auditorium, right? The whole Coliseum or whatever. And I thought to myself, it doesn't matter. These people are happy and some of them have tears going down their face. And the music caused people to be passionate and to worship God in an amazing way. Have you ever experienced that kind of thing, that kind of love for music and other people? If not, maybe we can be better. So, if you're honest with yourself, and I've seen this a lot in confession time, I do it myself, driving down the street, and a song comes on that you really like. What do you do? You turn the radio up a little bit, and you sing the ball, right? There's no bouncing the ball. You know the words because you've sang it a million times, right? I love this song because it speaks to you, doesn't it? It brings up a memory. It helps you to remember who you are. So as we listen to Jesus in the scripture, we hear familiar words. The next word we hear is soul. Hmm. It's closely related to what we think of as our personality. It really means love the Lord your God with whatever makes you, you. Maybe you're happy go lucky. Maybe you're outgoing. Or maybe you're an introvert. Maybe you're organized and you like to plan ahead. Maybe you just take it as it comes. We are all different, and that is all right. Because one size does not fit all disciples. The message is that there is no cookie cutter discipleship. However you and I are wired, whether we're extroverts, introverts, whatever it is that makes us unique needs to be put out there to work for the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all of your soul. No holding back. And then we hear the word mind. First Peter says, Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands it from you, an accounting for the hope that is in you. Do you have hope that you can share with someone else? As a United Methodist, we have what is called a systematic theology. I've always said Methodists have a method to their madness. You could say that we have this cerebral approach to the matters of faith. We want to know why it is, how it is, and what makes it work, right? I've learned that um, the gospel can go beyond our rational scope of divine grace. But even with the resources that we have, we all try to use our brain power to help not only ourselves, but we help anyone who wants to know and be comfortable with loving the Lord your God with all of your mind. Finally, Jesus uses the word strength. 
This is a serious power. It's not like, okay, that's all I've got. It is like the power that's behind dynamite. There's a concentrated effort or focus. All the resources are drawn together in a common cause. And just like when I was at, their, at that concert, there was no way that anyone's mind was wondering about what was going to happen tomorrow or what they needed from the grocery store. They were all in at that moment. Every part of them was engaged, and they were all about worshiping God. Everyone is concentrated and consecrated. You like that? Those who can sing, sing, and those who can do AV tech stuff can do AV tech, and those who can play the organ and the piano, those who can, I mean, we all have a part, right? Those who usher, usher. And those who work with children, work with children. The list goes on and on, and each one does what they can to pull their share of the load. Love the Lord your God with all your strength. It doesn't mean you hold back. Up to this point, these people were listening to Jesus banter back and forth with the local rabbis. And nothing that was said would have surprised what they surprised them from what they heard. After all, love for God and the God who is celebrated by the psalmist who made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever and executes justice and cares for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, opens the eyes of the blind and watches over strangers and upholds the orphan and the widow. Love for this God would be pretty easily human, right? Jesus' response to the question about which commandment supersedes all the others, well, they kind of knew that because it was from Deuteronomy, and it's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But Jesus added, Love your neighbor as yourself. For the first time, a respected Jewish teacher is saying that there is this relationship between our devotion and our worship of God and the way that you and I treat other people. Hmm. Love of neighbor was not some unheard of concept. The commandment had been around since the book of Leviticus. But linking love for God and love for neighbor this way was a novel approach. Did you notice after that, no one dared to ask him a question? They were thinking about this new concept. It's not very new to us, though, is it? We've heard it a lot. Loving your neighbor as yourself, it's kind of like the golden rule. Treat folks the way you want to be treated. And don't do things that you wouldn't want done to you, done to somebody else. In fact, we're to go the extra mile, deliberately doing things for one another that you know are needed and appreciated. One more thing, we're to be generous. So in a nutshell, what it means to love your neighbor as yourself means that you don't hold back. You go ahead and you do loving acts of kindness even when you don't feel like it. So let me ask you, how are you doing in following this commandment that Jesus gave us? Are you loving God with every part of you? Are you loving those around you and not holding back? I have learned that when I pour into others, there's this sense of healing, of generosity, of gratitude. Do you know that love is healing? Have you ever experienced that in your life? 
to know that someone cares. They actually see you. Maybe it's someone that you really don't know, but they can help with the simplest of tasks. If you were struggling, would you appreciate a helping hand or an attaboy or an attagirl? Recently, this happened to me when I went to Sam's. I had put a bunch of waters, cases of waters, in this cart. And as you can tell, I'm not a very tall person. So I got the first two out and put them in my car. Well, that last one, I had to reach way over in there, and the cart wanted to roll this way, and the plastic was ripping on the case of water. Anybody can relate to this? And so I'm like, oh, dang, and I'm putting my foot on. This guy comes running over in the parking lot and goes, ma'am, I'll get that for you. Ma'am. I was grateful. He had no problem at all. Whipped that thing out and threw it right in my car, and I'm like, Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really nice of you. I appreciate that. And I said, I hope you have a blessed day. Can you and I do a better job of loving God and loving others? So what might be our biggest hindrance in doing that? Maybe you don't think you have enough time. Maybe you think you don't have enough money. Well, maybe it's both. Maybe we're scared of being rejected. I don't know, but if you stop and think about it, how many meals have you actually missed because you didn't have enough time or money? God gave us a standard for giving. He told us that we should tithe or give 10% of whatever we earn. People hold back from tithing, and I believe that people do that for two basic reasons. They think that they don't have the money to give because they will not be able to make it to pay their bills or to get what they need. Or they withhold money because they want to make a point, hit them in the pocketbook. That's what I've heard people. But I want to ask you a serious question. Do you think that loving God with every part of yourself and loving your neighbor as yourself holds anything back? These are questions that I wrestle with. And I'm going to be really honest. I see on the financial sheet every week what people give. I don't know who gives what, but I see a tally. And I've had conversations with some people that I trust. And I've also thought about, should I continue to give? Should I give my 10% when nobody else wants to do that? And then I have to talk to God about it. And I continue to give my 10% because I know what is right. When we hear or we see and support others, we usually want to know more. And when we know more, we usually join these efforts. I was pleased to see, I don't know how many of you watch Spectrum News, but every once in a while they turn it on, and there was a woman in a certain area, and she was using food that, like, the grocery stores were throwing out. And then I read this article about the Society of St. Andrews, which was given the first hero of food recovery and gleaning award by the United States Department of Agriculture. And they do the same kinds of work. The society collects more than 2 million pounds of fresh produce. And it's perfectly nutritious food. But it might have some cosmetic deformity, you know, like the pepper might be not completely formed on one side or whatever. And it makes it unsealable. People don't want to buy it. This food is 
is delivered. It's picked up and then it's delivered to soup kitchens, food banks, Salvation Army centers, and other homeless centers. And then it's made into meals. Ken Horn, a United Methodist minister who is the co-founder of the group, accepted this award and noted, there is enough surplus of food in this country to feed every hungry person. I want you to think about that. He said, no one should go, ever have to go hungry. And I say, amen to that. I just watched this woman, and she was amazing. She made a comment, the same thing that he did. He it, she said, we throw enough food away to feed every hungry person. Wow. Wow. Can you imagine that God would mind if a person goes hungry, I think God really cares that hungry people don't have something to eat. And when we say that we love God, we have to demonstrate that. Our love cares about those that are hungry. And people aren't hungry for just food. People are hungry for relationships. We do that here at High Park Bethlehem and I know this church. We have a blessing box. And people bring and donate items to be put in that blessing box. People drive by, they see the blessing box, and people know what it is. It's empty most of the time, but we put something out in the morning, it's gone by noon. Just putting little effort, a little time and money, when I say that, you might have food that you've not eaten for two, three, a month, whatever, sitting on your shelves. You take the time to go through that. Or maybe you're at the grocery store and you pick up a box of peanut butter crackers. And you spend a little extra money. And you bring it so somebody can have something to eat. Or maybe it's pieces of clothing that you can no longer wear. But we make a difference. We can touch someone with the love that we share through our blessing box. In the month of November, we will have a stewardship campaign. And we will ask members to fill out a pledge card and turn it in so we can keep the church ministries running. But between now and then, I would like to ask you to prayerfully consider what God would have you do considering your tithe to a church. Will there be new ways that you will help to expand and share the love of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and to live out your love for God and neighbor? Literally, this puts our money where our mouth is. A rabbi was asked, which act of charity is higher, giving out of obligation, giving from our heart? Those in the class were inclined to respond that giving from the heart meant more, but they knew what the rabbi was going to say. And he was going to say just the opposite, they thought, because spiritual teaching is not about logic. The rabbi says, giving from the heart is a wonderful thing. It's a very hard act and should never be demeaned. But there's something much more important that happens when someone gives out of obligation. Consider who's doing the giving. When someone gives from the heart, there's a clear sense of oneself doing something. In other words, heartfelt charity always involves ego gratification. However, when you and I give out of obligation, when we give at a moment when every part of our being is yelling, no, I'm not going to do that because of one reason or another, perhaps a beneficiary is disgusting or we think too much of money or a thousand reasons can go through our heads to avoid giving. And then we're confronted with our own egos. And 
and we give nonetheless. Why? Because we are supposed to. And what this means is that it is not us doing the giving, rather God is using us as a vehicle in which to give. God says, here, O Israel, here, Hyde Park, Bethlehem United Methodist Church, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment that is greater than these. So how are you doing? How are you doing with those two commandments? Do you wish that you could do a better job fulfilling them? I read of a minister talking to children about the importance of living right. He wrapped up his talk with a challenge. He said, now if all the good people in the world were red and all the bad people in the world were green, what color would you be? I want you to think about that for a minute. If all the good people in the world were red and all the bad people in the world were green, what color would you be? One child thought for a few minutes and finally after he thought about it for a while replied, I think I'd be striped or streaky. Well, after the mountain days, wouldn't we all? So here's the question. How well are you loving God? And how well are you loving your neighbor? Will you allow your love to be part of what is needed? Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood 
of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat and remember. This is the blood of Christ, given for you. Take and drink and remember. Receive now the benediction. The saints past and present, have helped us to belong to God in meaningful ways. Share your love in passionate ways that make a difference in the way that you love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And go and love your neighbor. Thank you.